Dan Johnston, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to have this conversation. We've been preparing for this episode for a while. And today we're going to be focusing on advice for supply chain employers who are struggling to hire. Now, we know we're in the throes of the great resignation. Clearly, hiring right now is a challenge in most industries for most types of jobs. Uh, but it's it's a particular challenge within the supply chain and, and trying to get those those workers who can come in and, and continue to keep things moving uh, really effectively. So clearly, hiring is, is an important piece of this. I guess retention is another important piece of this, um, which plays into the same equation of just making sure we have the, the best talent people there with the skills and capabilities necessary to help us be successful and to carry out you know, the value we add to the market. So that's what we're going to be exploring together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Dan's bio with everybody. Dan Johnston is the co-founder and CEO of Workstep. Workstep's software platform empowers companies to find and keep frontline supply chain employees for the long run. Prior to Workstep, Dan managed a third-party logistics warehouse and co-founded InstaEDU, an education technology company. Wonderful background. It's a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we dive on in? Uh, no, I mean, I think you hit the, the key highlights there, Jonathan. I think really the, the key there is that Workstep was born out of this personal experience of mine, which is as a warehouse manager, I saw really, well, A, just how detrimental that legacy temp staffing model was to the workers in our building, right? Uh, Using temp staffing as a way to both acquire and manage supply chain talent was expensive for the company I worked for, but also create a situation where the wages of our workforce were functionally being garnished by this agency. The workers couldn't move up within our organization because they didn't actually work for us. And we were running trainings basically every day because of this constant rotating door of new people coming in. And so what we do at Workstep is we build software that helps large companies who make and move physical products better hire and retain the frontline teammates across their supply chain. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And that's a little bit of the background behind why you created Workstep, which is super important. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this current labor crisis that we're in. You know, people have termed it as the great resignation, the great awakening, whatever, uh, all these different things. The, the point is it's hard to find good people <laughs> right now. Um, there's, there's a lot of competition in terms of wages and other total compensation and perks and those sorts of things. Uh, people have simply reevaluated what's important to them and re, uh, you know, reconfigured their pri- and reprioritized, you know, what is going to matter most. How, within that context, do we, you know, attract people, and how do we deal with this labor crisis? Yeah, I mean, you're right that it is. It has reached crisis levels, you know, especially in the supply chain. I think, you know, uh, it's been a long time since I've taken an economics course, but when demand goes up and supply goes down at the same time, uh, things get a little bit wonky. And that's what we're seeing, right? There are, you know, more than two and a half times as many warehouse workers in the United States today as there were a decade ago. Basically, the boom of e-commerce is driving more and more jobs from sort of endpoints like retail stores to midpoints, you know, warehouses, production facilities, manufacturing facilities in the supply chain. And so there is this constant and growing demand for talent to get the goods that people need to their doorstep for the most part. At the same time, like you mentioned, people are reevaluating what they need from a job. People are embracing you know, new career pathways, like predominantly freelancing and gig work. People are still sitting out of the workforce because of you know, health and safety concerns as it relates to COVID-19. And so on the one hand, you've got demand from companies at sky high and increasing levels. On the other hand, you've got this constant turnover and less available talent than there has been in the past. And that's creating a lot of hardship for companies. And so the second part of that question was really like the how to address this current situation. And, and our belief is really that 
the best way to compete in this market that has a meaningful macro shortage of talent is to focus on retaining the skilled workforce that you do have, which is those companies who are winning in this war for talent are the ones who need to bring in less new talent sort of per worker because they've created the systems, processes, and environment within their company that encourage employees to stay with their organization instead of going across the street to a company who does something very similar. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. And it really does illustrate the, the challenge because people do have options. They can go somewhere else and, and you know, right now, probably find more money, <laughs> uh, you know, perhaps have more flexibility than what they're currently experiencing. Um, so there's just all those different components and factors that play into the decision making that people are, are going through. And so you, you hit the nail on the head, we, we need to be thinking about retention of the people we do have while proactively you know, having a strategy to go out and find new people and to really just create a good employee experience so that people want to work for you because it doesn't take long uh, for, for you to get a bad reputation as, you know, kind of that, that employer of last resort. Like if I can't find anything else, I might go work for them, but otherwise there's no way I want to work for that company. You know, that's, that's the, the, um, the worst case scenario, right? If you're trying to attract and retain good people in this labor market, in this current climate. No, it is. And I, in this, in this climate, the employer of last resort, isn't seeing much. I would say yeah, the, employer, yeah. the, middle, the employer middle resort is struggling and the best of breed employers are, are having challenges. I think that you know, the good news is that it's not overly complicated how to address this problem as a large company who relies heavily on frontline talent, right? First and foremost, you know, what we've seen is that 89% of frontline workers are more likely to stay with their current company if they feel that organization encourages and listens to their feedback. So like from a base case perspective, just like what is sort of the fundamental line that companies need to start stepping over? It's how do I ensure that I'm listening to feedback from my frontline talent at scale, ensuring that they feel heard and then acting on that feedback to help create better workforce satisfaction and retention. But really, even just that listening part and encouraging workforce feedback and ensuring that feedback is heard is that first step to an organization becoming a place where people want to work in an environment when they have many, many options. Yeah, and truly many, many options is is the name of the game right now. Um, and you've laid out some of the types of things we can focus on in terms of retention. Uh, ultimately, employee experience and all facets of that are going to be really essential. We have to listen to our people and understand what they want, what they desire, really what they're looking for most. Otherwise, you know, even if we try to offer really great perks or you know other incentives, they may not be aligned with what our people actually want or what's salient to them. And so, so we need to continually be just thinking about that. I'm curious if, if, if you have noticed any specific differences in terms of uh, this context that we're talking about, uh, specifically with supply chain employers and employees versus perhaps some of the challenges that people are facing in the, in the more broad uh, labor market. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. I mean, you know, humans uh, aren't that different generally, right? So the things that a person wants, whether they work behind a desk on Slack all day, whether they work in a warehouse or whether they work in a restaurant, tend to be relatively similar, right? They want to feel purpose. They want to be fairly compensated. They want to feel safe. They want to see a pathway to self-improvement. Uh, what's interesting, though, and, and as a bit of backstory, of course, this is not a pitch, but what we do at Workstep is we provide retention management software. And that software not only helps companies collect feedback from their workers at scale, ensure they feel heard, allows them to address hot button issues in real time, but it also connects feedback 
to outcomes. And so what the algorithms are able to do in the background is say, what is the points of feedback at which parts of a worker's life cycle that are sort of the precursors to turnover? And what are the points of feedback that are sort of not precursors to success? And so what we're able to do with that data at scale is say, okay, here is what is actually driving turnover in this industry. And here are points of potentially dissatisfaction that are much, much less correlated to turnover outcomes. And so, you know, across the board in the supply chain, we see that consistently the number one driver of turnover is career growth. Workers who don't feel like they have growth pathways available to them at their current organization are by far the most likely to quit. Or said another way, those companies or facilities or business lines who are able to ensure that their frontline workers see a path to advancement are the ones who do the best in terms of frontline workforce retention. But that's at an industry level. I think one of the most interesting things that we see and that our customers see is that the driver of turnover in your Denver warehouse might be very different than the predominant driver of turnover in your Cincinnati warehouse. And so it really is about understanding, okay, for this particular group of employees, what are the problems they're having that are causing them to quit? And how can we address it? And then sort of across our entire organization, asking the same question. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's well said and uh, super important as we consider the variations. And the reality is, you know, our people aren't a monolith. And so even within, you know, there's so many consistencies across human nature and, you know, what employees want, um, certainly, uh, but even within a, a niche like supply chain, uh, there's going to be huge variations in terms of what our people want, what they really demand. And that has a lot to do with just you know, variations in life stage and, uh, you know, background and, and current context that they find themselves in in their, their personal life. Uh, and so ultimately, we just have to be aware of those things and continually be asking the questions, listening carefully, really intently, so that we can try to match with what our people are, are saying that they really want. So all of this then gets us into really, what do we do about it? So we're in this crisis, it's a challenge. Uh, there's the, all these various dynamics playing into the crisis. What specific actionable bits of advice would you give to employers right now within the supply chain area um, who are really struggling to hire? What tips and advice would you give them on how to respond to this current situation, how to weather the storm? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, uh, every situation is a little bit different, but we've seen, you know, sort of very tried and true methods as it relates to uh, weathering the storm, I think is the term you use. So first of all, on the talent acquisition side, those companies who are able to build repeatable pipelines of direct hire candidates and who are aligning those new hires to sort of accurate expectations of the role that they're going to be coming into uh, and sort of ensuring that the role that they're offering sort of matches the preferences and the ambitions of the worker are having the most success. So the alternative there is either doing the sort of spray and pray hiring approach, which is, you know, basically shotgun blast, bring in a ton of folks, hope that some work out or the temp to perm hiring approach, which means bringing in a temp staffing firm and a temp staffing workers, and then, and then trying to convert some of those at the end of the day. So first and foremost, focus on direct hire talent who work directly for your organization and who genuinely have preferences that fit the roles you offer. That is step one on the talent acquisition side. On the other side of the coin is talent retention. And the most important thing an organization can do there is build the systems that allow them to collect feedback from their workforce at scale, understand what parts of that feedback is driving workforce outcomes, 
take actions to improve sentiment in those areas that are driving turnover and measure the impact of those actions that they're taking. And of course, software like Workstep can help sort of at all parts of that workforce funnel. Uh, but the most important thing is that companies are viewing their frontline teammates as what they are, which is essential, and prioritizing their satisfaction, safety, growth, and retention via whatever means work for the particular organization. Yeah, excellent. And I, I just have to, you know, double tap on, double click on that, uh, the the employee development component that you mentioned now a couple of times. Um, ultimately, people want to feel like there's a path forward. They want to feel like there's opportunity for growth and development and improvement and career opportunities, um, leadership opportunities, whatever, right? And so ultimately, one of the best things we can do, and this actually applies probably to most jobs, to most types of employees, and to most organizations, whether you're in supply chain or not, is you want to really think thoughtfully about the talent pipeline. You want to think thoughtfully about um, alignment of values between the people you're bringing into the organization, what the organization is trying to accomplish, and not just in the short term, not just like you know the next six months, year, uh, two or three years, but really like five years from now. Uh, maybe they'll still be here, maybe they won't, but let's, let's treat them as though they will be. Let's create an environment where they will, where they will want to be, where they're feeling invested in that we want them to stay and then create pathways, uh, a variety of pathways for people to develop and grow. Uh, some people are fine moving into a, a job like, uh, you know, a warehousing type of a job. And, and clocking in, clocking out at the end of the day and just kind of doing the same thing. And, and they have other priorities. They have other creative outlets. Maybe they want to focus mostly on their family and they just need a paycheck to pay the bills and everything. Some people are fine with that uh, for really their whole career and their whole work life. But a lot of people aren't. And a lot of people simply, if that's the situation they find themselves in, they're going to get discouraged. They're going to get burned out and they're going to look for other opportunities at other places. So we have to have a variety of pathways put in place to allow people to grow within the company. Otherwise, we're just inevitably going to lose our best people. Uh, and we're going to have that constant that constant uh, revolving door of people coming in and out like you were describing. Uh, and then think about all the wasted time and resources just to onboard people, train people, get people up to speed, just to do the basics of the job, not even you know talking about getting them really integrated into the work uh, so they can start to think about efficiencies and productivity and other ways to create, be creative and innovate in the space to allow not only themselves, but other people around them to, to do the job more effectively as well. You know, all this comes back to just, we, we need to invest in our people. Um, career development pathways is one form of investing in our people. Um, but there, there's just so many things we need to focus on when it comes to that continual commitment to our people investment. Yeah, I mean, obviously I agree. And that that's sort of the, the, the catch 22, I think of the last decade, which is, you know, if you look at annualized turnover over the last 10 years, in any industry, realistically, but especially in, you know, uh, distribution, warehousing, transportation, manufacturing, what you see is an up into the right graph. Heck, it could be a startup's growth graph. It's, you know, every year people are leaving jobs at higher rates than they did the year prior. And this was going on well before the so-called great resignation. It just finally got a catchy name. Um, and what that is leading some companies to do is say, if I'm going to lose 85% of my employees every year, there's really no point in my investing in on-site training, in development, in enabling my warehouse workers to become truck drivers or forklift mechanics or diesel mechanics, right? Because 85% of them are going to leave. And so maybe somebody else can provide those skills and I'll go find those skills elsewhere. Now, the problem with that approach is, of course, that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where the more you treat workers as fungible units who are going to be in one door and out the other within six to 12 months, the more that behavior continues. And so what it takes is a forward thinking organization that spans both HR, typically in operations, to say, 
we are actually going to try to reverse this trend by investing in our people so that those investments can pay off over time as we you know, structurally reduce the rate at which we're turning through this talent. And so I think it's just been a tricky decade where it's sort of just been this like runaway train where as turnover accelerated, people tend to invest less, turnover accelerates more, people invest even less. And now all of a sudden we've got skill shortages, you know, who's training this next generation of talent because the employers don't want to do it. Unions have sort of less density. Um, sort of legacy training organizations don't really have the capacity, right? And so I think we're starting to see this sort of reinvestment in frontline teams from large companies. Uh, but I think we have a long way to go. Yeah, and I think right now that the current crisis is shining a light on this. And you're right. I think it's it's become a bigger and bigger issue over the last decade. But let's be honest, it's not a new thing either. Like this, this, this tension <laughs> in the workplace and investing in your employees has existed. It's it's existed since organizations existed. Uh, and you know, I've I've been in this space for a long time. And I'm sure people who've been in it longer than me could point to even earlier days, but 20 years ago, this was an issue. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it was even before that. And the reality is many organizations, unless they're a people centric organization focused on the needs of their people, uh, then they tend to really not give enough attention to this. And they, they see their people not as human beings who need to be invested in, need to feel valued, that they have opportunities to contribute in meaningful ways, opportunities to develop. If they don't see them that way, uh, then they're not going to invest in them. Now, the, the, the catch-22 and the irony of what you were just sharing is, of course, this, this negative downward spiral, if we're not investing in our people, of course, they're going to leave more. Uh, and then that just reinforces our thinking around, well, I'm not going to invest in them because they're not going to stick around. Guess what? The opposite is also true. Right. If you invest in your people and you give them pathways and you give them opportunities to develop themselves, they will stick around and it becomes not a downward spiral, but an upward spiral. And it, it just, it, if, if we don't have a people centric, people focused executive team, it's really hard for them to see that. And especially if they're struggling, you know, if, if revenues are down or there's any sort of um, pressure, you know, financial pressures, uh, as we know, most organizations uh -huh. face, then it's, it's hard to see that because it's an investment in the future and it, you know, it may not pay dividends today or tomorrow, or even this quarter, it might take a few quarters. It might take a year to really start to see those benefits, but man, there's so much research on this. It will pay dividends in the long run if we can just be committed to it. Yeah, and I think I think we're seeing I think we're starting to see this turn, right? Part of it is the market, and and every company is starting to need to think of themselves as an employer, either first or second, right? I mean, I think you know Amazon even went as far as like restating their corporate mission, right? It used to be just like be the world's most customer centric company, and now it's be the world's most customer centric company and the world's best employer, right? Because they know that they can't be customer centric if they don't have the talent they need to run their vast distribution networks. And so you're starting to see, you know, Walmart spend a lot of time in their most recent earnings call and they haven't always been known historically as, as being the most employee centric organization, true or not, but they spent a lot of time working on their employer brand as well and implementing programs. And so you see the largest employers starting to to do this, and I think many times other folks will follow. But but at the same time, like you said, there's cost pressures everywhere, right? And so you know, in the supply chain, you know, fuel surcharges, uh, cost of raw materials, there's pressures everywhere. And so yeah, it does take a a little bit more of a medium term view for companies to say we need to be investing in our people too, because that's what's going to set us up for success in 2023, in 2024 and beyond. And it's the right thing to do. Yeah, it, it really is. It's the right thing to do from the business case, bottom line perspective. It's the right thing to do from the human case, yeah. <laughs> employee centric perspective. So we we just need to do it. Uh, we're really gonna find ourselves behind the eight ball on this uh, if we aren't already. Well, Dan, it has been a real pleasure 
uh, this time has flown by. We could continue, I think, for a, a long time. Uh, but before we close for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, how they can find out more about Workstep, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, anybody can find us at workstep.com. Uh, if anybody's interested in the services we provide or potentially working for Workstep, anybody can also email me directly, dan at workstep.com. Uh, you know, as far as the final word, I think it's just that it, it is time for organizations of all sizes to put their frontline teammates first and to really put the structures in place to enable those teammates to be both happy and successful over the long term, which is, like you said, good for people and also good for business. Yep. Well said. Thank you, Dan. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Dan and Workstep can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.